1969, the Vogel Louverture Press in London published The Groundings with My Brothers, the first book by Walter Rodney, which highlighted his activities in Jamaica during 1968, the year he was banned by the Jamaican government. In February 2019, 50 years later, the 14th annual Huntley Conference at the London Metropolitan Archives heard Jamaican cultural activist Carolyn Cooper on the topic bearing witness the Walter Rodney uprising in Jamaica. So the presentation comes here to the UWE Museum today. Uh, inside our exhibition, quite appropriately, our exhibition confrontations, UWE student protest and the Rodney disturbance of 1968. So we're very, very happy to welcome uh, Carolyn Cooper. Um, I said to her that we should really have gotten her CV and she kissed her teeth, which you will <laughs> take as a very appropriate response, <laughs> since she really does need no introduction. Uh, her current title of choice is cultural activist, and that's the one that we've used. So I'm sure that she will say as much as she wishes to say in terms of, of what she's doing now and how it relates to her earlier self back in 1968 when she was a newbie here at the University of the West Indies, like so many others that we've talked to over the past several months, uh, who came to UWE and immediately came into the protest that followed the banning of Walter Rodney. So Carolyn, thank you so much. Come, please. Thank you, Susan, when with my enoughness, I said to you, when you don't hear people talk in London, you know, I'm taking me to the museum, and she readily agreed, so thanks, Susan. When I entered the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica, in October 1968, I had long been schooled in a fundamentalist religious culture against which I instinctively and quite rationally rebelled. I was born into the notoriously conservative Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventism was established in Jamaica in 1894. The very first congregation built a church on Text Lane in downtown Kingston. That building was destroyed in 1907, and a new church was built on the corner of North Street and James Street. It is now the church hall. The growth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church over the next 30 years resulted in the construction of a much larger building. And I have to tell you, you probably know that Adventism is the largest um, denomination in Jamaica. No, I cannot understand why. <laughs> so my mother was the leader of the, what was called the Dorca Society, which catered to the physical needs of the less fortunate members of the congregation. My parents then were pillars of the church. I was a very small act speaking away at the foundations. At Sabbath school, there was always a mission story about some benighted individual from a distant culture who was discontented with her, his or her religion. He or she would go searching for a more satisfying explanation of the meaning of life. The result was always the same. The seeker would find Adventism and reject the old ways. My constant question was, how come we routinely celebrated the difficult decision to abandon one's religion but we were not encouraged to look carefully at our own beliefs. The response I got was that we already had the truth, so there was no need to go looking for it. You can just imagine how frustrating that complacent answer was for an inquisitive young adult who could clearly see the contradictions that the mission story barely concealed. The rational principle of investigating alternative paths to truth clearly outweighed the naive conviction that there was a single truth conveniently encoded in the DNA of Seventh-day Adventists. It was clear that university education was going to give my restless imagination even more scope for development. <laughs> Indeed, the University of the West Indies was routinely demonized by fearful church members as a hotbed of radicalism, a veritable seat of the devil. The preferred tertiary institution was the Seventh-day Adventist West Indies College, now Northern Caribbean University. But my mother, an elementary school teacher, had no confidence in the academic program of the college. Furthermore, I had won the 1968 Jamaica Scholarship Girls, which facilitated my entry into UWE, so the matter was settled. All the same, it was decided that I needed divine intervention to protect me at the secular university. 
So on the Sunday afternoon when my family took me to my hall of residence, we were accompanied by the pastor of the church. In exactly the same way that other believers would have taken their child to an older man or woman for protection from bad men and grudgeful people, <laughs> my pastor was brought along to the university to offer prayers for salvation from dangerous intellectual inquiry. Nevertheless, by the middle of the month, on October 16, I was out on the streets taking part in the infamous water running <laughs> demonstrations. Clearly, it didn't work. The meeting of the Guild of Students that was called to discuss the appropriate response to the banning of the eminent historian by the government of Jamaica took place in the dining room of my hall of residence, Mary Seacole, and I have some lovely images of Seacole stamps. Um, you know, and you can see Mary Seacole Hall is one of them. There was no question about attending. I was living at the very center of the excitement, and I use the word excitement deliberately, as you will see later on. I certainly didn't understand all the issues, but the eloquence of the older students was persuasive. I made up my mind to participate in the demonstration. We had been instructed to take damp towels to protect ourselves from tear gas. As it turned out, I was quite lucky and was able to jump into a passing car when we were first tear gas in Ligany. The march soon divided. Some students went down Hope Road to Jamaica House, the office of the Prime Minister. You have already seen my slide, which is here in the exhibition <laughs> as well. You see, they're all male students. It's a Glena photo, so I guess Glena didn't think it was appropriate to try and catch some women. We were definitely there. Others went downtown to the Parliament building, and it was there that the demonstration intensified as student protesters were joined by sympathetic members of the public. Now, I took what I anticipated would have been a less dangerous route. I optimistically headed down the fortuitously named Road of Hope. But as we approached Jamaica House, I noticed what looked like a mobile police station. It suddenly struck me that I could actually be arrested. The demonstration immediately lost its appeal. I don't know what I would have told my parents who had sent me to university to study literature not to engage in the fiction of revolution. <laughs> After all, I was in the march for nothing more than the excitement it promised. I was not motivated by any grand political principle. I was a relatively naive teenager out for the fun of it. I quickly calculated that discretion was indeed the better part of valor and withdrew from the march. I went to a new nearby high school, got some newspaper, and carefully wrapped my gown. Back on the main road, I saw a police inspector, and in all innocence, I asked him, Officer, what is going on? <laughs> Fifty years later, I cannot remember his exact words. His response was something like this, Too serious, my child. I can't even tell you. I felt absolutely no shame at resorting to subterfuge. I had learned the lesson of all the Nancy stories I had been taught. Duplicitous deceit is both self-protective armor and also an immoral weight that burdens the soul. It all depends on the circumstances. Confident that I had done the right thing, I retreated to the university. I should have gone home. We were imprisoned, we were imprisoned on campus for an entire week, as I think is now widely known, as police and soldiers cornered off the university, presumably looking for dangerous radicals. So classes were canceled, and we had the luxury of time to reflect on the meaning of the protests and our role as university students in transforming political systems of inequality. I was becoming radicalized in this relatively brief period, brief, brief period of enforced introspection. It was no longer diffuse excitement that would motivate my actions. It was focused attention to the politics of the times. Proverbial wisdom self-servingly declares, me come here for drink milk, me not come here for cotton coal. This proverb cautiously advocates immediate gratification of physical needs, not long-term investigation of how scarce benefits are distributed. Ya, yeah, here, is usually a generic location. In the context of the uprising, the Rodney uprising, Ya yeah, was the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. Now these days, if a lecture was banned, the only question the average student would ask is, so who is going to take over the class? <laughs> and you really have to understand, with the high cost of tuition, books, housing, food, transportation, and so on, most students are focused on getting in and out of the university as fast as possible. Their goal is a big job. They don't have any time to cold call. They just want to drink milk. 
My generation of students also counted the cost of university education, but we counted cow as well. The immediate consequence of the Rodney uprising for many of our students was that it forced us to interrogate our assumptions about our place in Jamaican society and the wider Caribbean. The late 1960s was a period of self-discovery in which the cry of black power animated conversations about racial identity and national consciousness. The rhetoric of independence masked the visible signs of neocolonialism, so we had to take stock. We started to understand that university education was not just about getting a piece of paper that would entitle us to a big job and transport us into the middle class. We also began to recognize that political engagement, counting cow, was a quite dangerous mission for academics. If you took teaching seriously as a revolutionary practice, both on and off the university campus, as Walter Rodney did. You could be declared persona non grata by cowardly politicians protecting their exclusive right to drink milk. You could be banned from teaching at the very institution that was supposed to nurture intellectual inquiry. And there's a lovely picture of Rodney with painting, which is this one here. Walter's crime was that he fully understood his obligation to function as a public intellectual in a supposedly post-colonial society. He had to bear witness about the nature of Caribbean societies and the way in which the ruling elite were perpetuating systems of oppression. The medieval conception of the European University as an ivory tower was completely irrelevant in the Caribbean where university education ought to engender radical transformation of fundamentally unjust social and political institutions. Walter Rodney's groundings with his brothers and sisters in marginalized communities were designed to open the eyes of the oppressed and motivate them to take responsibility for transforming their lives. Now the banning of Walter Rodney by the government of Jamaica became the catalyst for the launch of Vogue Louverture publications in 1969, as Susan tells you. The first book, The Groundings with My Brother, was Rodney's classic early work. Ewan Thomas edited the book, and Richard Small wrote a penetrating introduction. Now, the final chapter was excerpted from a speech reflecting on the ban which he made in Montreal in October 18, on October 18, 1968. In the concluding paragraph of his introduction, Richard Small recounts the following quote. Rodney has said in an interview in Montreal that what he said to the middle class audiences is the same he said to the meetings in the gullies. He spoke mainly about Africa's past, the qualities of her civilization, who were her personalities. But the difference was that when he was speaking out in the open, he was speaking to fertile ground, people who from their conditions in Jamaica had already arrived at the conception that Africa has a history and they only require the illustration of that belief. People who believe that exist all over the island. Rodney did not organize them. They existed there before. More today, it is true. And that is because of what Rodney taught and what was done to him, unquote. The banning of Rodney was not a local Jamaican matter. It had global repercussions. It signified the vulnerability of the neocolonial elite in the Caribbean and in Africa and elsewhere, who could not countenance any challenge to their authority. Rodney's own trajectory, from Guyana to Jamaica to the UK to Tanzania and back to Jamaica, is a global African narrative of cross-cultural affiliation. Walter went from Guyana to Jamaica in 1968 to study history at UE Mona, graduating with first class honors he then went to the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and completed his PhD in record time. In 1966, Rodney went to Tanzania to teach at the University College Dar es Salaam. He immediately became involved in local politics. In 1967, the ruling party, the Tanganyika African National Union, issued the Arusha Declaration and a policy of socialism and self-reliance was introduced. After the declaration, student groups set up the Socialist Club, which later became the University Students African Revolutionary Front. Rodney became one of the young faculty members who actively supported the students. Isa Shibji, a retired professor of constitutional law, 
No, Malie Moutou is in here, research chair in Pan-African Studies at the University of Dar es Salaam, recalls in Pambazuka News that Rodney provoked Prime Minister Nyerere by giving a militant paper at a seminar organized by the Youth League of the Ruling Party. Rodney described the new national governments across Africa as, quote, petty bourgeois regimes that had hijacked the revolution, unquote. The new state of affairs was nothing but a quote-unquote briefcase revolution. Rodney's essay was published in The Nationalist, the party newspaper. An editorial, probably written by Nehru himself, was immediately published with the headline, Revolutionary Hot Air. It declared that Rodney was welcome to remain in Tanzania, but he should not incite young people to become rebellious. <laughs> Rodney wrote a conciliatory response which Shivji summarized his quote. Basically, he defended himself, but he was also appeasing in that he was thankful and grateful he was allowed to stay here and that when he talked about capitalism and neocolonialism, he was only talking about that system which carried his ancestors as slaves into other parts of the world. And now he was trying to establish a reconnection and talk about this gruesome system which is still with us. Unquote. Now, this is a politically engaged Walter Rodney who returned to Jamaica in January 1968 to teach at the University of the West Indies. Prime Minister Hugh Shero was not as charitable as in the year. Rodney's reasonings with Rastafari and other dispossessed groups in Kingston made him a target of the security forces. Believe it or not, he was seen as a threat to the tourist industry. In the last chapter of Groundings, Rodney gives a black and white account of why he was bad. No, unfortunately, um, the screen is not as big as when I did it elsewhere, but I so you won't be able to read it, but I'm going to read it. Um, he says, the government of Jamaica, which is Garvey's homeland, has seen it fit to ban me, a Guyanese, a black man, and an African. But this is not very surprising because though the composition of that government, of its prime minister, the head of state, and several leading personalities, though that composition happens to be predominantly black, as the brothers at home say, they are all white-hearted. Now, Rodney must have known that Jamaica's head of state was a white-hearted white woman, the Queen of England, though represented in Jamaica by a black man. In any case, Jamaica was just another example of a petty bourgeois regime, or worse, to make your former colonial master the head of state of your supposedly independent country is nothing but lunacy. Rodney's radical Pan-Africanist sensibility was manifested in the philosophy and practice of Jessica and Eric Huntley, founders of both literature publications. From the outset, the press announced its international reach. The visionary name they gave their embryonic publishing house signified their revolutionary consciousness. Bogle, that militant Baptist preacher who led the Murat Bear insurrection against the continued oppression of black people in a supposedly post-slavery society. And that poster is by Michael Freestyle Thompson. The other um, name, Louverture, of course, um, is that of um, the revolutionary from Haiti. And we have another nice image of, I like him, that image I found on the internet of him sort of rooted. And, you know, that rootedness signifying the sense of organic um, revolution. Now, Bogle-Louverture publications bore witness to the urgent need for decolonization of the mind advocated by Marcus Garvey. So, as Garvey put it, next slide, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. Mind is your only ruler, sovereign. The man who is not able to develop and use his mind is bound to be the slave of the other man who uses his mind. So over the last five decades, Bogluvator publications have certainly advanced the process of emancipation from mental slavery. And this is how Jessica Huntley defined the mission of the press in her publisher's note to the 1975 reprint of Groundings. She said, the founding of Bogluvator publication was based on a corporate decision to make a total break with the usual tradition of publishing, that of black people passively providing the human material to be written up and published by other people, unquote. 
Jessica and Eric actively commissioned books which put black people at the very center of the publishing enterprise as subjects, authors, editors, illustrators, and of course, readers. Now, Bogle Overture is one of a small number of publishing houses in the UK which have all taken up Marcus Garvey's challenge to complete the decolonization process. New Beacon Books, Alison and Busby, which is now defunct, Carnock House, and Carrier Press, and there's still other um, smaller publishing enterprises in the UK. And of course, with the rise of the internet, people do all kinds of publishing online. Now, I must confess that when in preparation for the talk, I recently reread Groundings, I spontaneously laughed out loud at the opening paragraph and said to myself, them did have to run him. From the perspective of 2019, Rodney's words are nothing but the plain truth. Half a century ago, the historical facts laid out by Rodney would have terrified the Jamaican ruling elite. This is what he said. In 1938, exactly 100 years after the supposed emancipation of the black man in Jamaica, the masses once again were driven into action to achieve some form of genuine liberation under the new conditions of oppression. The beneficiaries of that struggle were a narrow middle class sector whose composition was primarily brown, augmented by significant elements of white and other groups such as Syrians, Jews, and Chinese. Of late, that local ruling elite has incorporated a number of blacks in positions of prominence. However, irrespective of its racial or color composition, this power group is merely acting as representatives of metropolitan imperialist interests. Historically white and racist-oriented, these interests continue to stop attempts at creative social expression on the part of the black oppressed masses. Unquote. Now, the ruling elite had wickedly constructed a fraudulent national motto out of many one people. On the face of it, this was an aspirational claim intended to heal old wounds. In fact, it was a deliberately dishonest attempt to create the illusion of racial harmony in a society still suffering the consequences of institutionalized racism and class prejudice. I will never forget my sixth form English teacher, Miss Julie Thorne, an English woman who had come to Jamaica to do her bit for empire. It was she who forced, first forced me to question the happy fiction of our national motto. She once tagged an irreverent question onto the motto. Out of many one people, which one? <laughs> As an outsider, she was able to see quite clearly the way in which whiteness is privileged in our society. And whiteness isn't just a literal color. It's a lifestyle, a value system. Money can make black people white. Furthermore, the language of Rodney's groundings was plain English, Disdaining the convoluted syntax of conventional academic discourse, Rodney spoke complex truths in an easily understandable way. This would have further threatened the ruling elite who knew that Rodney's message would reach its target audience. On the day of student protests against the banning of Rodney, Prime Minister Hugh Shearer issued a statement on Radio Jamaica. You can hear the full text if you go to the um, you know, speakers afterwards, but I'm just going to play a little bit of it. Um, okay. And while we're lining it up, I can just go on to say that Shera declared that it was not Rodney's participation in the Black Writers Conference in Montreal that precipitated the ban. He hinted at a much graver crime that will be disclosed in Parliament the following day. On October, on October 18, 1968, a report of the speech in Parliament was published on the front page of the Gleaner, which we'll come back to. Ladies and gentlemen, the demonstration in the corporate area by the students of the University of the West Indies campus at Muna today is a display of hooliganism and irresponsibility. Students who are enjoying the opportunity of higher education, which places them in a category of privilege, and students, too, who are being trained to examine issues logically and with impartiality, 
should be the last persons to allow themselves to be inflamed by fanatics and their emotions to be influenced by agitators. Among the responsibilities of the government of Jamaica, a responsibility which was given to it last year by the majority of the people of this country, is the responsibility for the safety and internal security of Jamaica. This is a responsibility which the government will not abdicate and has no intention of sidestepping. I therefore condemn. In fact, I am satisfied that all true Jamaicans condemn the shameful behavior of the students who conducted themselves in a the manner they did without even making one small gesture to ascertain whether there is any justification in the decision to declare Mr. Rodney an undesirable person. The fact is that there is very substantial justification for this decision. I repeat, very substantial. Some of the Jamaican students themselves ought to be aware that they have been duped into supporting a destructive anti-Jamaican cause. And a large number of Jamaicans, particularly in Kingston, St. Andrew, Clarendon, and St. James, know that there is full justification for the action taken by the government. It is one thing for foreigners to indulge in and support such activities, but it leaves open to question the loyalty of any Jamaican who knowingly supports anything which harms his country. The government has no intention of allowing subversive elements to destroy the security and stability of Jamaica, which has been built up over many years by the hard work and sacrifice of the hundreds of thousands of peace-loving people of our country. <laughs> and are these hundreds and thousands of people actually benefiting, you know? So, on October 18, 1968, a report of the speech was published on the front page of the Gleaner with the alarmist headline, Government Acted to Save Nation. The newspaper reported that, quote, Shearer tells House details of Guyana's, Guyanese's Castro plot. There were bullet point summaries of the main allegations. Well-organized groups sprang into action. Revolution must come, said Rodney. Many foreigners among agitators. Campus pamphlet said, burn UWI. I don't know who would have said burn UWI, but anyhow. There, there it is, front page of the Gleaner, October 18, 1968. Appealing to rank xenophobia, Shearer acted to save the nation from the disturbing truths that Rodney was disclosing in his groundings. And I just want to run through just four statements that um, Rodney made in groundings as I come to my conclusion. First one, from Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was one of the first advocates of black power and is still today the greatest spokesman ever to have been produced by the movement of black consciousness. The USA was his main field of operation after he had been chased out of Jamaica by the sort of people who today pretend to have made him a hero. <laughs> it is just so true. All right. Next one on violence. He says, by what standard of morality can the violence used by a slave to break his chains be considered the same as the violence of a slave master? And next, the white capitalist cannibal has always fed on the world's black peoples. White capitalist imperialist society is profoundly and unmistakably racist. I mean, this is what Rodney was saying 50 years ago. You can imagine how this very fragile, or as I heard a lady say, this fraggle, um, <laughs> this fraggle um, 
independent government would have felt in response to this. And especially since he was a foreigner, they could use the foreign thing to, you know, mobilize Jamaican, pro-Jamaican sentiment. I remember this was a government whose motto was Jamaica, yes, Federation, no, because the Jamaican Labour Party has always been associated with a very nas- narrow Jamaican nationalism, CARICOM, and all of that is very foreign to them. On revolution, Trotsky once wrote that revolution is a carnival of the masses. When we have that carnival in the West Indies, are people like us here at the university going to join the Bacchanal? <laughs> okay. Bogle Overture was also published Walter Rodney's classic, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. In his preface, Rodney deploys a vivid metaphor. Quote, certain solutions are implicit in a correct historical evaluation, just as given medical remedies are indicated or contraindicated by a correct diagnosis, diagnosis of a patient's condition and an accurate case history. Hopefully, the facts and interpretations that follow will make a small contribution towards reinforcing the conclusion that African development is possible only on the basis of a radical break with the international capitalist system which has been the principal agency of underdevelopment of Africa over the last five centuries, unquote. And the Caribbean, I'm sure we'd all agree. So in conclusion, give thanks for the work of Jessica and Eric Huntley and their collaborators in struggle for black liberation. The books that Jessica and Eric have published over the last 50 years eloquently bear witness to the ongoing process of emancipation from mental slavery advocated by Marcus Garvey. Give thanks for the work of Walter Rodney, who as public intellectual and political activist, bore witness to the urgent need to emancipate ourselves from all forms of oppression. Thank you. Go ahead, Q. Uh, Karen, I'm a little unclear as to the justification that was given in Parliament. The reasons how was the action of the government saving Jamaica? Could you just go over that? Well, I really don't know, you know. I mean, I've listened to the, the speech. But remember, you know, this is a government that banned a book called Black Beauty, which is about a horse, because they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't know. It was just, the black was just in the name, you understand? And I guess, you know, you would have thought that in a black society, the beauty of blackness would be something that would be celebrated, even if it was not human beauty. So I think the justification, I don't know the details. I really haven't researched that aspect of it properly, and you are the editor, so you are, you, I'm giving, throwing back a question at you. But I believe that the justification you saw in those headlines, that here's this foreigner coming to Jamaica, fomenting revolution, mashing up the tourist industry, and we have to do something about it. And you remember just a little bit that I played, you know, you were saying that the students didn't even ask what were the reasons. They just knew that they were going to go out on the street and, you know, march, and it was just so irresponsible of them. But so, so the justification, I believe, is simple, that this is a force that is challenging our authority. I think that is basically what it was. But, you know, I'd be happy if anybody else in the audience has any better answer. I'd be happy to hear what, what, you, what you... So it's 50 years on. Yes, I am, Annie. Good to see you here. Good, yes. And um, I wonder about the university joining the Bacchanal. What, what's your take <laughs> on that possibility? <sighs> you see, oh, you want to get me to mix up? <laughs> I, I tell you, you know... I don't think we can expect big, big revolution from a university that is tied to funding from regional governments. You know, that he who pays the piper calls a tune. And I think at the administrative level, maybe there's a greater caution about how the university might function as a space for revolution. You know, I think we're in an accommodationist phase. But I think individuals on the ground have to recognize that each of us has a responsibility to try to make life better for the majority of the people in the region. So that is a kind of bacchanal that I think is possible. Individuals trying to do what they can to effect change. I don't know that the institution itself is... Uh, 
is a is a force for revolution. Um, Bacchanal has to be individuals winding down the place and saying things have to change. Yes. Yes, Mark. Mark Figueroa speaking. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit, bit about why Walter was banned. The first thing you remember, when Walter came here as a student, he was already under surveillance, mm-hmm. and he was on, under surveillance for that period. The thing that Walter did was to disturb that motto that you mentioned, <laughs> the, the insecurity of the ruling group, mm-hmm. uh, the possibility that the black issue would be raised. Now, remember that in the early 1960s, uh, Miller Johnson launched a political party called the People's Political Party using Garvey's original name from 1929. And um, Miller Johnson is noted for going on the stage and saying, Norman Manley say come red, I say come black. <laughs> and um, Walter Rodney, as a student, went on Miller Johnson's platform along with another Ghanaian colleague whose name I do not remember, but Arnold Bertram would remind us if he were here. (laughs) Um, So that he was under surveillance, he also went to Cuba and he went to Moscow, so that he was seen as a dangerous Marxist element. And um, it is of note, though, that the CIA station did not think that he should be banned, so that the, um, the local elites were even more insecure than the American CIA, who, who wrote all their cables and documents that are now available about the period, said that he shouldn't be banned. They said he was a nuisance and he may become dangerous, but at the moment they didn't think that he was really a problem. So that chair was really feeling very insecure. Mm-hmm. The other thing I should say about this apothecal banning of black beauty, <laughs> um, we can look at the books which were banned, which include all, anything Marxist, Anything published in China or, or, or the Soviet Union, anything black power, Mohammed speaks, and from the Black Panthers and so forth and so on. I think that in the case of the ban- banning of books on the Industrial Revolution and black beauty and so forth, it was more the ignorance of the customs officers mm-hmm. who <laughs> took these books. Somebody come in with a book on the Industrial Revolution, they say no. You Revolution. Can't. You can't. <laughs> And Black Beauty, which is a novel about a story, a very sentimental story, which we read as children, um, it was reputedly taken away from persons at the airport because it, it was a dangerous book inciting revolution in Jamaica. But in a sense, you know, notions of Black Beauty were in fact revolutionary in Jamaican society. So that could... Sorry, the film that is made for the exhibition, if you haven't seen it, that is, a, that is a part that comes mm-hmm. out of it. And um, Jackie Vernon, mm-hmm. whose picture you see there, mm-hmm. um, speaks about that mm-hmm. issue and Rodney's message about black beauty. Mm-hmm. Yes, Michael. Yes, thanks, Carolyn, for an engaging presentation. I'm very glad, by the way, that the exhibition is still up and mm-hmm. running. So, um, Suzanne, thanks for that and all the help that you've had. And I hope it, it can go up, stay up till the summer. I want two, two questions mm-hmm. really, Carolyn. One is this period from um, when Michael Manley takes the reins of, you know, um, administration. PNP comes into power in 72. Mm-hmm. Questions are, abound as to why the PNP being seen as more progressive in comparison to the Hugh Shearer administration, why they didn't lift the ban on Walter Rodney, and so, uh, because apparently he was sneaked into the country, um, I think it was 70, 72, thereabouts, but he was sneaked in, but if they lifted the ban, he could have basically, you know, moved back and forth between Jamaica um, without any, um, you know, um, obstruction. That's one question. The other one is the dialogue. First of all, let me tell you, I can answer that question. You know, I don't know why the, band, the government didn't leave the ban. I could only speculate and say that, you know, there's sometimes hardly any difference between the PNP and the JLP. It's power that defines people's actions. And the, man, the government might have seen him as a continued threat and just didn't want to do anything about um, lifting the ban. But I don't know. Mark, I don't know if you have any more information than that. 
Well, he wasn't exactly sneaked back into the country. Um, he came here for Carifest, I believe. And then he came for the launch of the Workers' Party. Um, but I don't believe the band was ever actually lifted. Mm. But, they were, but, it, but waivers were kind of given, mm. but I don't. Um, maybe one day we have to ask Screed to explain yes. it to us. You know? <laughs> right. We have to get Screed to come and give us a talk. Talk, absolutely. <laughs> Other question, Michael? The other one was the dialogue between Nwere and Walter Rodney, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and being, you know, Nwere, we know, is a champion of African socialism. Mm -hmm. And it, it was clearly a meeting of minds initially because Walter spends a lot of time in Tanzania. But this fallout that you basically alert, alluded to, um, and you can see the dialogue... Um, and, and it pertains very much to the Sixth Pan-African Congress of 74. Mm. Um, do you think this is why Walter eventually leaves Tanzania and goes back to Guyana? Do you think he became disillusioned with um, what was going on in Tanzania? Or was You're it just... asking me to speculate, which I cannot yeah. do. Okay. All I can say is that, yes, Nehru might have been a socialist, but a socialist in theory and a socialist politician two different things. And when you're a politician, you want to make sure that you, you, know, you can run things. And if you're running things, you can't afford to have people like Walter Rodney stirring up students who might become militant forces challenging your administration. So you see, a lot of times the, time the rhetoric of socialism clashes with the practice of political um, insecurity. You know? Nicholas Smith? Yes, Nicholas. Um, do you think that the Carl Garden's massacre incident mm -hmm. of 63 and the government's response to it had any connection to the with how they responded to Walter Rodney? Is, maybe might maybe a not a direct connection, but is another example of a conservative JLP government um, using force to keep down any kind of resistance to their authority. You know, when Buster Manta says, bringing all Rasta dead or alive, you know, it's, a, it's a complete rejection of the Black Paul philosophy advocated by Rastafari. And it's, the Rastafari became a symbol of resistance to Eurocentric domination, which is what the, the party and the government represented. So there is a connection, maybe not direct, but it's part of a trajectory in which um, the political elite attempt to repress all forms of resistance to um, cultural domination. Follow up? Yes. Well, I suppose it's related to, to your response, but yes. I think they were also pushing an idea of a harmonious society. Out of many one. Right, out of yes. many one, which... Could you, could you answer this for me? This is a question I have. Is it actually a knockoff of the, the American motto? E a a, a Uno. Yeah, a lot of countries have that same sounding motto, you know. Mm -hmm. But in Jamaica, given the history of oppression of black people and the fact that if you are a sane person, you come to Jamaica and look in an audience like this, you see that 90% of the people are black. So, you know, where is where's the out of many? Where are the out of many people in the audience? You know, it's, it's really, as I say, kind of aspirational. It's an attempt to erase the black majority. That is all it boils down to. So that instead of recognizing that it's a black majority society, you say it's an out of many one society. And this is a way for the brown elite to insert themselves at the center of national discourse. Because the out of many one is itself, can be read as a kind of hybrid identity. Out of many one is get this one mix up, as my high school English teacher pointed out. So, you know, it's a way of erasing the black majority, saying you, you are not entitled to claim any special ownership of this nation, even though you're in the majority. As Marley said, we slave for this country, but that doesn't mean anything. And I like to, in 50 years, Jamaica is going to be predominantly half Chinese and Chinese, and black people are going to completely disappear. You know we won't be here to see it, but I know it's going to happen. All right. Sorry, Kylie, I'm going to impose on your time a little. But since, since people ask about it, I'm going to tell a story. Yes. When, when Michael Manley won the election, he came, to, he came and gave a speech at the Assembly Hall here on campus. And he, he was very popular and mm -hmm. triumphant at the time and much welcomed. 
and he was waxing poetic, you know, and somebody must have asked him a question about the banning of books, and he waxed poetic about he don't believe how, um, you know, we should prevent people from freedom of thought and all this. <laughs> I was a young and inexperienced agitator at the time. <laughs> and I said to him, what about people? What I should have said is, what about Walter Rodney? Yes. Which is what I really meant. Mm -hmm. right? And he used the deflection. He said, oh, young man, you know how I think. Um, and then he started talking about his popular programs. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, I confronted him and I said, what about the banning of Walter Rodney. Mm -hmm. And he said under no circumstances he was going to lift the ban mm -hmm. on Walter Rodney. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. But you know, Michael evolved and, and zigzagged. Waffled. And zigged and zagged. So <laughs> I don't know what could have happened or may have happened subsequently. But he told me personally that under no circumstances mm -hmm. he was going to lift the banning of Walter mm -hmm. after trying to embarrass me publicly <laughs> when he knew what I was asking him. But he <laughs> deflected the question. I just think I wanted to make a point about that banning thing because it has more to do with legislation and the, the myriad of layers of persons in the whole structure that will make that sort of considered decision. I mean, I would, I would think, just speculating, the governor general or somebody at that level, you know, there must have been some sort of protocol um, put in place. And that is why... A, a argument about needs or anything like that. It's exactly that. Because you can be defined by a government or by groups in the society and actually banned. And it's forever. <laughs> well, this is before my time, but I, I really have to disagree with that. And maybe Mark could chirp in here. But I think if Michael Manley was clear and his administration were determined to lift the ban, they could. Because we have seen JLP, PNP, um, they may agree on certain things, but one of the legacies we have is a party comes in and they have a different agenda. They, they will change. operate that agenda. I'm sorry, but the Governor General is just, you know, just symbolic. If they felt that this was to their advantage, it would make yeah. the change. You know, you know, to take Mark's story at face value, if Michael Manley had thought it was an important political decision to make, he would have lifted the ban, but obviously he didn't see it as important. In fact, you see the continuity between the, the governments. That Instead of lifting the ban, could you have um, used the philosophy and opinions of the person that was declared non grata instead of just lifting the ban. Yeah. Yeah, the but ideas, use the, the ideas. Yes, That's yeah, but I'm, you see, the lifting But to what the extent were the ideas of the government, of Rodney used, so to speak? Well, I don't know that the I, I mean, Manley's government was supposedly socialist in the 70s, and um, Rodney's philosophy was socialist, Marxist, radical. But um, I don't know that just carrying the philosophies, as you say, would substitute for the larger issue of lifting the ban, because in a way the ban is a white mark against the, the individual.